Morning, everybody. <clears throat> Hopefully I can talk today. <laughs> Glad everybody's here today and uh, I'd like to start out our study with a word of prayer. And I have a couple couple of requests. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, you've blessed us in so many ways with our our health, with our homes, with the jobs that we have, with the uh, providing for us in many other ways too. And Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be able to enjoy these blessings. Lord, be with us today as we study. Lord, that we may become more mature, more, more solid Christians, that we can conduct our behavior and to evangelize, evangelize out to others. And Lord, we know that you hear our prayers as evidenced by so many blessings. We ask especially, though, to pray for Denise McConnell as she's entering surgery uh, this morning. That, Lord, be with the doctors and help them to, to correct the problems that need to be corrected and that when, once they're done, that she has a speedy recovery, get back to normal, and that she's comfortable and in good cheer. And Lord, we ask a, a prayer for Sandy Sanders. He's recently had surgery and he's in recovery. And Lord, we pray that he's comfortable and that he's, that he's reaching to you, Lord, and find strength in this uh, difficult time, a difficult physical recovery. Lord, we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we didn't quite finish the lesson, so it, um, it translates into this lesson, so I don't want don't to skip it over. So we'll start in First uh, Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 15 to 27. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we'll start at verse 15. Can everybody hear me real good back there? All right, good. All right. Okay. So where we, where we uh, left off last week, we're talking about Paul's restrictions of his rights. He's, um, he's talking about how he has certain rights as a Christian, as a man to do certain things, that he is not uh, acting on those rights. So he's, it's, it's further away for him to uh, commit himself to the work of the Lord has given him. So in chapter 15, we start, but I have not used any of these rights. I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. And though I'm free, I belong to no man. I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew, to win over the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become one not having the law, although I am not free from God's law, so as to win those not having the law. <clears throat> to the weak, I become weak, to win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, 
but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make, make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. If, uh, if anything else, this is, this is Paul saying, come on, let's get going. This is what we're doing. This is, let's get inspired. Um, now, just because Paul doesn't exercise his rights doesn't mean that every one of us has to go out and do the same thing. Paul showed the Corinthians that he was an apostle and deserved the, deserved the rights of apostleship, but he also had shown the Corinthians that he hadn't claimed his rights as an apostle. And after stating that again, he did not use his, his, apostolate, his privileges as an apostle. He explained he was not trying to get the Corinthians to have pity on him. In other words, to uh, start taking care of him financially and supporting him. He's not trying to talk them into that. And he, uh, and to begin meeting his material needs, he, uh, he took pride in the fact that he proclaimed the gospel free of charge. And none of the Corinthians could claim that they had reimbursed him for his time and effort. Okay, this is significant too because there, as Paul will warn, there are, there are people out there, false teachers, who will um, be a teacher for, for profit, and they're not, they're, they're false teachers. They, uh, they exploit the words of God for their own uh, circumstances, for their own well, uh, support. And um, that's a sin. But he didn't want to be, he wanted to be above reproach. He didn't want people to say, well, you know, here it is, he's an apostle and, and he's coming in here requesting all these funds and, and trying to pressure people. No. Paul realized that he would encounter people who would say he was a minister of the gospel only for the sake of material gain. When these encounters happened, he would be able to argue that he had preached the gospel not for selfish reasons, but for reasons of his love for Christ. And Christ himself had called Paul to preach the gospel, and so, so he felt compelled to preach. If he refused to obey the Lord's directive, his life would be miserable because he was so compelled. And then Paul said that proclaiming the gospel without charge was his own reward. On the other hand, it would have, wouldn't have been wrong if he had accepted material support from those who he ministered to. And by doing so, he'd be fulfilling the responsibility of preaching that had been entrusted to him. But Paul wanted to prove the genuineness of his ministry to those who might have been looking for reasons to reject the gospel. Remember, we were talking earlier uh, in our studies about um, becoming a stumbling block. This is one of the ways that Paul didn't want to become a stumbling block. It's not just for people who are weak in the faith, but it's also for people who want to look for a way to reject the faith. Anyway, we can learn from Paul's lesson, too, on the basis of what we'll get in return. Rather, we should approach the work of the Lord with the hope that our reward will be that people will accept Christ. So, after this, Paul goes into the foot race. And he talks about running to win a prize. And so what is our prize for um, bringing the gospel to other people? What's, what, what prize is there for us at glorifying the Lord? Well, I think the example that Paul gives is really good. He runs to get the prize. But it's not a prize that will perish, but a prize that will be everlasting. Now, if anybody out there has, has ever participated in any kind of a competitive event or thing, you know that there are some people that are just 
just the most talented, the fastest, the, uh, the strongest, and they get up there first and they win the prize. So what's that, where does that leave the rest of us? Do we not get a prize? Well, yeah, there is a winner, but all of us must run to win the prize. Um, that doesn't mean you win the race, but you win the everlasting prize because you are running and you don't stop running. You never stop running at all until you get to that point where you're finished. So, you know, at first when I read the, read the scriptures, I thought, gee whiz, well, what happens if you're not coming first? Does that mean that you lose? Well, do you know any athlete out there, like say in the Olympics, that is really going for the monetary value of that gold? Maybe there is one or two, but don't you think the glory is what they're really after? That's what we should be after too, but not personal glory, the glory of God. So yeah, you can't lose when you're doing it for the glory of God. Okay, so that'll, that's going to bring us up to chapter 10. So chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 1 and go down to about verse 13, and we'll discuss it. Okay, these are warnings from his, the history of the, the Israelites. And Paul writes, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and the rock that was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be adulterers, uh, idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Then do not grumble, as some of them did, and they were killed by the destroying angel. <laughs> These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings to us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you can stand under it. So these are warnings. If, if you read back in the Old Testament, as soon, soon as the, uh, the Israelites were on the move in the desert, they uh, made a lot of mistakes. They wanted to follow God, but they kept falling back. And we were talking a little bit earlier about, about running a race. Well, this is Paul telling us how to run a race, um, to not make these pitfalls, or to, to not uh, fail in these pitfalls. Now, in Corinth of the day, <clears throat> idolatry was dominant in the culture, and Christians seemed reluctant to completely divorce themselves of some of the adulterous practices. Paul probably felt that the Corinthians didn't realize the spiritual danger they were in. They probably didn't. Um, you can see that some, somewhat in um, today's culture too. We, we adopt, I don't mean us per se, but uh, culture will adopt things from other cultures that were are as a majority popular, but don't necessarily fit with worship. Um, in, the in the case of the Corinthians, though, it's likely that some of them believed that since they were baptized and were participating regularly in the Lord's Supper, that they could safely engage in idolatry and other sins. So Paul used a lesson from history and he showed that the Corinthians 
The ancient Hebrews had a kind of baptism. Let me back up. Paul used this lesson from history, and he showed the Corinthians that the ancient Hebrews had a kind of baptism and a kind of Lord's Supper, and yet they were punished by God. So, first, Paul told the Corinthians how God had guided the ancient Israelites with a pillar of cloud, and how when the ancient Israelites were trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian chariots, God had parted the sea for him. He described the Israelites passing through the sea as a type of baptism. At their outset, at their outset as a nation, they were identified with Moses, their leader. In a like manner, the Corinthian believers were baptized into Christ and had become his followers. You see this pattern. It's amazing how many times this pattern repeats itself, too. The, um, the, the, the baptism and then becoming new in Christ, they were um, attached to Moses. <clears throat> now, if all this wasn't enough, I, uh, sometimes I've made the mistake of saying, well, you know, if I could just see tangible evidence, then my faith would increase. Well, here's proof right there that even though we might think that, it really doesn't work that way with us uh, rebellious human beings whether we're Israelites or not, it doesn't work that way. So, the apostle reminded his readers of how the Israelites had eaten a miraculous food and drank miraculous water. The Israelites had manna, which was a spiritual food because God gave it to them in a miraculous manner. The same was true with the water God provided them. And since the Old Testament does not tell about a rock following the Israelites, we can assume that it was just a, um, um, a spiritual rock, a spiritual rock. And Paul believed that the Lord had been involved in caring for the wandering Hebrews' needs. So that was the main thing, that he brought them out there and he took care of their needs. Have you ever uh, thought, well, you know, my needs are being taken care of. I've, I, you know, I've got food, I've got clothing. I've got shelter, they're being taken care of, and all, the Lord takes care of all of us. I think everyone in this room could write a list of stuff that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, the Lord has provided and that we're, we're aware of, but doesn't it sometimes fall short in our own uh, humanistic minds where, well, I want more than what I've been provided. I want, I want water when I want it. I want the kind of food that I want it when I want it. Um, I don't necessarily want to go <clears throat> when the pillar moves. Um, it scares me. So I'm going to grumble. Um, I don't get the things that I want when I want them. I'm provided with the stuff I need, but it's easy to fall into that kind of thinking. Anyway, moving right along with that, the Christians at Corinth, to the Christians at Corinth, the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper were similar to the water and the manna of the Hebrews. And the bread and the wine were, were spiritual food to drink because they had represented Jesus' body and blood, which had been sacrificed to provide for salvation. And Paul explained that even though the Israelites had a baptism and a Lord's Supper, most of them died in the desert for their lack of obedience. The manna and the water did not spare them. In a way, they were disqualified for the prize. And so, so that the Corinthians would not misunderstand his point, Paul told them that the events from Israel's history were an example for them to learn from. The tragedy that overtook the entire generation of Israelites could serve as a warning to the Corinthians. God was strengthening their faith and labors, and nonetheless, they were to be careful, to remain focused on the Lord, and to not get involved in wickedness. <clears throat> so this, so having said this, Paul focuses them on some of the notorious incidents from Israel's history that occurred. 
first point was telling them to be on guard against falling into idolatry. Idol idolatry, not adultery, idolatry. Paul reminded them of the Israelites' worship of a golden calf. Now, the issue with the golden calf was when Paul or when Moses went on onto the mountain to receive uh, the Ten Commandments. He was up there what forty days, okay. Um, and in Exodus thirty-two, this is the part <clears throat> when the people saw that Moses was so long coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, "Come, make us gods." who will go before us. And as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So here it is, they've been following him for so long. He goes up, he leaves his, his second in command in charge, and all of a sudden they don't know it. He was just gone for a little while. So that shows that they really didn't trust God or Moses. They went to their own devices as soon as he was gone. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold ear earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters were wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to, to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Fashioning it with a tool, they said, Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So it, it's not just the people, it's, it's Aaron as well. They, instead of reinforcing uh, what Moses had taught and what he had seen in God, he, he too fell back. And this type of thing was exactly what he was supposed to prevent. I can only imagine that the pressure of the people that were there without Moses to be um, the leader, with that kind of pressure, Aaron fell back on his, uh, his old ways and they fell immediately into idolatry. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. And afterward, they sat down to eat and drink. So Moses had not returned the high priest caves in, Aaron. And this really follows what the Corinthians were doing with their spiritual leaders, and especially to the Apostle Paul. And <clears throat> Paul, like Moses, also saw God. He had to. In order to be a priest, he, 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 fought, he, he had personal contact with God and with Jesus. But the Corinthians, like the Israelites, were falling back on the old ways, when Paul was gone from them. That's really why he's writing this letter is he heard all the stuff that they were doing and was coming back to straighten them out. So what happened next? The Lord says to Moses, <clears throat> go down because your people who brought you up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it themselves <clears throat> and sacrificed it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. So God was going to just wipe them all out. So I've had enough. Wipe them all out. We'll start over. He's going to keep Moses. We'll start it over and make you a great nation. Can you see the pattern being set up here for the coming of Christ? Because what did Christ do for us in our sins? He, he, he died for our sins. He, his blood washed our sins clean. Moses did sort of the same thing. He pleaded with God not to destroy his people because, you know, everybody knew these were his people, and if he destroyed them, what would that say about what would people say about God? So it's, even though Jesus wasn't concerned so much with that, he was concerned with their salvation, Moses was also concerned with the salvation of God's people. And he had the, uh, the uh, fortitude to actually plead with God. I think that's why God chose him. 
Okay, so the other thing is, Paul reminded them not to test the Lord. No, he did that, but let's look at this the one before that. He, he told them not to, or to refrain from sexual immorality. Paul reminded them of the Israels engaging in sexual immorality with the prostitutes who worshipped at, at the Moabite god, Baal. Telling them... And this is a reference he makes to uh, what we see in Numbers, uh, chapter 25, verses 1 to 3. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women. And these women invited them to sacrifices to their gods, and the people ate sacrificial meat and bowed down before these gods. And so Israel yoked themselves to Baal, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Now, we, t- we talked earlier, we studied earlier about how Paul said, well, you know, the, the, the meat sacrificed to, idol, to idols is nothing because idols are nothing, so you can go ahead and eat of it, which is still true. But you can't attend the festivities and par- participate in them because that meat is offered and sacrificed to demons. And that's why it's wrong to go to, to do that. Um, and so what, what was the price they had to pay for this? The Israelites had to kill every man who yoked themselves to Baal. I mean, these were their fathers, their brothers, sons, husbands. This was all to appease God's anger. That was, uh, an, this was supposed to be a, an example, not to fall into idolatry and immorality, sexual immorality. Imagine if we had to do something like that today. We, we can thank God that Jesus died for our sins. Now, remember I was talking earlier about how being provided for and actually getting what we want are two different things. Well, Paul's telling them not to grumble against the Lord's servants. And Paul reminded them of the Israelites grumbling, grumbling against Moses and Aaron because of God's harsh judgment. And this one he's referring to uh, Numbers 16. Yeah, Numbers 16. If y'all remember this, um, this is where, I'll just read it. The next day the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron saying, you have killed the Lord's people. They said, but when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned toward the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And they fell face down. Then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with burning coals from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. And the plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said, ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead. And the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague. In addition to those who had died because of Korah. Now, if you all remember who Korah was, Korah and, and 250 of the others opposed to Moses. They were opposed to Moses because they were angry that Moses and Aaron set themselves above them. And this is another thing that the Corinthians are dealing with. Remember back at the very beginning of the lessons, they had uh, factions within their congregation, and some of them followed one prominent person, the others followed another prominent person. Well, they had this problem here too because Korah and and the rest of them that, that were following him were upset because Moses and Aaron put themselves above the rest of the people. What their claim was is that the whole of Israel was holy and that Moses was no better than they. And what was their punishment for doing that? It says in the scripture that God sent them alive 
The earth opened up, they went down alive into hell. Not spiritually, but physically too. So God reasserted his authority at that point, but they still rebelled against him, saying that he, he killed the Lord's people, saying that they're holy. Why did the Lord kill his, his people? You see how they're using this play of words instead of looking at the example that God is showing, they're trying to rationalize and justify their way of thinking. So, how to kill rebellious family members, witnessing so many killed uh, by plagues, so many killed by snakes, witnessing God sending rebels to hell alive while being, all the while being led by a pillar of fire at night and a column of smoke by day through all the trials and tribulations that they had been through, bringing them to this point, the Israelites were still prone to sin. It seems like they had every opportunity in the world to increase their faith in God, but so many of them didn't. Go back to the example we had of running the race. There were some people that dropped out. They said, I'm tired of running this race. I want to go do my own thing. And they didn't make it to the promised land. Only the people that continue to run and continue to be faithful. Sometimes when I read the scripture, I think, well, geez, all of the Israelites, how, how did any of them make it? Well, some of them kept running that race, even though, you know, they fell into one of these uh, one of these stumbled, they stumbled into one of these pits. But God gave them a chance to, to, to turn away from their sin and to turn back to him. And in the Old Testament, this is something that occurred between Moses and God and the Israelites. And today we have that through the blood of Jesus. Okay, let's look at let's look at Corinthians chapter ten, verse fourteen to twenty-two. I should say, yeah, fourteen to twenty-two, and this is going to focus on the uh, the, the idol feasts and the Lord's Supper. And Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to you as sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean that these sacrifices offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want to bring you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot drink. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So this really has a lot of significance when you see it in light of what the Israelites uh, did prior to this point is that they um, missed the point. They thought they were stronger than God in rebelling against him. And isn't that really what sin is? Is rebelling against God? I think we can all admit that it's a re rebellion against God. Especially, have you ever, when you did commit a sinful act, as we all do, did you think about it ahead of time? I mean, are there any acts that we really could possibly do without even thinking? Most of them aren't. So if you have to think about it ahead of time, then there's room in there to not do it. 
but we do it anyway. There's other scripture that deals with that, but I think the point is, is um, the rebellious Christian or, re or rebellious Israelite, the same thing, would stand on that and say, okay, I choose to do this because I don't have any faith in that, in God. Whereas somebody who's still running that race that wants to reach into heaven will say, yeah, I did that. I shouldn't have done that. Please, God, forgive me for doing that. And then continue on to not do that sin. There's a big difference. The rebellious ones are the ones that stand and say, no, I'm, I'm not going to admit that that was wrong because then fill in the blank. But the one who's still running the race for God says, please forgive me, I've stumbled and I've fallen. I'm going to get back up and I'm going to continue on that course. So. <clears throat> anyway. Paul knew that the idolatry was rampant among the non-Christians of Corinth and that it was a constant source of temptation for many believers. And that's why he recommended the believer, reminded the believers about the Israelites slipping into idolatry. That's also why he argued to his readers to have nothing to do with the worship of idols. In appealing to the Corinthians' good sense, Paul asked them to determine the truth of his words. So which, which one are you going to stand on? Trying to steer the Corinthians away from participating in idol feasts, Paul referred to the Lord's Supper. Christ had established this ordinance while eating the Jewish Passover meal with his disciples on the evening prior to his death. Now, I know we're probably all of us are familiar with the Lord's Supper. We're going to participate in that later on in worship. But um, The original Passover, or when they originally celebrated the Passover, um, the one that Jesus was a part of, the high point of that feast really was when they served the roasted lamb. And it was after Jesus and his disciples had eaten the Passover meal that he instituted the Lord's Supper. It was actually after it. Because before that, um, they... Um, They would take uh, the first of four cups and pass it around. Each person at the table took herbs and dipped, dipped in salt water. And then the host took one of the flat cakes of unleavened bread that they had, broke it, and laid some of it aside. And one of the members would say, what makes this night different from others? And the host would respond by recounting the events of the Passover. It was usually followed by a singing of psalms and passing around a second cup before the actual meal was eaten. So when Jesus instituted the Passover, it was a third passing of the cup and uh, unleavened bread. You know, I think I knew that, but I just found it interesting that this is, again, Jesus is instituting a new order. You can see the old going away and the new coming. So the cup of thanksgiving, the one that uh, Jesus instituted, was one of the drinks taken by participants, and it was also a way of referring to the communion cup. Paul taught by drinking the cup of the Lord's Supper was like participating in the blood of Christ. And well, it is. And doing so would signify believers' fellowship with him. In the same way, eating bread at the Lord's Supper was like participating in the body of Christ. And... Not only did taking the communion unite believers in the body of Christ, but it also united them with other believers. And Paul emphasized that the part of the Lord's Supper, when he drew the Corinthians' attention to the single loaf of bread that they commonly shared during their celebration of the Lord's Supper. So it's bringing together. The apostle noted also that there were many individual believers eating a portion of the one loaf. But nevertheless, all of them were spiritually united. So even though we're all, like, he's promoting unity and we're all separate members, we're all participating in the same loaf. Spiritually united. 
So the point of this was, apparently many of the Corinthian believers felt no qualms about participating in feasts held at the temples. And if you remember last week, we talked about how common this really was. It was a social event. And they correctly reasoned that the idols represented lifeless, powerless gods and that sacrifices offered to them were meaningless. But where they were incorrect, however, was to conclude that there was nothing inherently wrong with participating in the idol feast. So Paul had to explain to them the differences. When we, when we are involved in the, in the Passover, when we're involved in the Lord's Supper, we're not only uniting with him and ourselves, but we're uniting with God. Jesus is God. You can't do that and then go over to Temple B and do the same thing, because you'll, then you'll be divided. And this was, to be, this was to focus the Corinthians on how God is one true God, how the other gods, gods being false gods, even though they don't, they don't exist, what's in our heart is what exists, what we think we're doing. Remember what Paul was talking about, how uh, we can't be a stumbling block to somebody who has a weaker faith? Well, that's a stumbling block. To um, be torn between a false god and the real god. You have to let go of the false gods and you have to know the real god. The false gods, all their worship uh, sacrifices are to demons, remember, because they wanted to exercise the demons out of their food so it wouldn't kill them when they ate. When we do the Lord's Supper, it's so we're not, it's to remind us that we're not dead in sin anymore. That's why it was so important that the Corinthians got this part. So next week, we're going to talk about Things that are permissible, but are or are not beneficial. That's in uh, the verses 23 to uh, chapter 11. So I encourage you to read that. And um, as always afterwards, let me know if you have any questions about the scripture. I'll, scripture I'll, I'll try to answer them scripturally. And uh, but anyway, that's going to be the lesson for today. Thanks.